Well, good morning, everybody, and Happy New Year. It is Emma here from Future of Leadership. Uh, thanks so much for being here. I know that it, it might be your first webinar of 2021, and it's our first webinar too, so we really appreciate you dedicating your time today to joining us. Uh, today we have our special guest, Kath Molly, and her topic is language for leaders and difficult conversations. So as always, during the webinar, if you have any questions, feel free to pop them into the chat box and we will answer as many as we can at the end. And as I mentioned, Kath will also be using the chat box to interact with us during the webinar. So we would love you to type your answers in there and chat with us along the way. So just before we get started, let me tell you a little bit about Kath. Catherine Molly is an international speaker, author and communication expert, specializing in leadership, sales and service. With 25 years experience in business, education, speaking and transforming lives, Catherine believes that business success rests on the ability to build real connections at Velocity. Catherine has owned and operated several highly successful training companies and been recognized both nationally and internationally as a leader in sales and service training. As Managing Director of OzPAC Business Advantage, she was recently awarded an International Stevie Award in America for Sales Training Education Leader of the Year. Catherine is also married. She has one husband, three children, and two dogs. So I'm going to hand over to Catherine now, and I will be back at the end. So, Kath, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, and it's great to see we've got people from all around Australia here. So a big welcome. I'm on the sunny coast looking out the window right now. A little bit windy, um, but not too bad. We have had a lot of rain and hopefully it's disappearing. Um, so a big welcome to language for leaders and difficult conversations. You know, a lot of the times we don't really want to have those difficult conversations. But what I do know is when we change our language, we change our life. And that's what we want to have a little bit of a look today at is what sort of language are you using? You know, Henry Ford says, if you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. So if we think we can do something, of course we can. If we think we can't do something, of, co of course we can't. So let's have a little bit of a look perhaps at some of the ways that we actually self-sabotage. So the reason I want to start with this is I think it's a great thing to kick off uh, January 2021 with because we all do things to self-sabotage ourselves and it comes through the words we speak it comes through our body language that energy we put into things so if we could knock self-sabotage on the head today that would be a really great start for 2021 I hope you agree now what I would love you to do is to have a pen and paper near you too just so you can jot these down along the way because I'm going to ask you some questions and I also want you to throw things into the chat box what I've learned being a professional speaker over the last you know 20 years is that the people that participate they're the ones that make the difference so it's really important to participate, get those reactions going, give me a thumbs up if you're participating, come on. And um, we can make a difference because we learn from each other as well. Thank you, Catherine. All right, so here we go. The first thing we do when we self-sabotage is we don't sink things into our bones. So I want you to write this down, not in our bones. And I want to ask you, what does that mean? When you hear the words, not in our bones, what does that mean to you if something isn't in your bones? So if you could quickly throw something into the chat chat for me right now, because I'd love you to let me know what you how this makes you feel when you see this. If it's not in your bones. And let me give you an example. Say it was New Year's Eve and I said, I'm never going to have a glass of champagne again. Well... I like to have a little glass of champagne when I'm celebrating. So I wouldn't sink that into my bones. So it's not going to happen. Um, Madison says that you don't fully believe what you were saying. Yeah, right. And we don't sink that into our bones. It's not going to happen. So if there is something that you want to happen, you need to sink it into your bones. You need to start to look at that every day to make that happen. So, for instance, um, Steve Bradbury, you've probably heard of him, Last Man Standing. And I love his story. 
uh, so he was a speed ice skater and he hated getting up. Like at 14 years of age, he had to get up every morning really early before five to go and do his training before school and then after school. So he had a note above his bed saying, get up, you're an Olympian. And I truly believe in that power of those visuals. So he got up and to go to the Olympics, even if you were the best in Australia, it doesn't mean you'll get into the Olympics. You have to make times as well because we've had some great swimmers that were the best in their field in Australia but couldn't go to the Olympics because they missed out, you know, by that point, blah, 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 of the second. So he still had to make the time frames to get to the Olympics. And while he was there, he made it through and I think into the quarterfinals, really worth looking this up and watching this video on YouTube. Anyway, so he got through the quarter and then he got into the semi and he had a strategy. The strategy was to sort of to stay with the pack and to stay standing. So he made it through into the finals. They're on that last lap. They were coming to the finish line. He was just at the back of the pack. And what happened? That first person slipped, took out second, took out third. They just all ended up over the ice skating rink floor and he skated through to first place while people were scrambling to get over. Now, you know, when we sink things into our bones and then some people said, oh, he, he didn't deserve that, but he had that strategy. He had worked so hard his whole childhood, getting up when he didn't want to get up because he sunk it into his bones to go to the Olympics. He didn't think he would actually win a, a medal at the Olympics, but his goal was to get there. And then he had his strategy and that's why they call him last man standing. And I love his story. And I think this is what happens when we start to sink things into our bones. You know, I have goosebumps now because I've been working with a lot of people doing goal setting and understanding their values and purpose to align everything. And this happens when we sink it into our bones. So if there's something that you really want to do, put it on a piece of paper, put it in front of you. Let, let it sink into your bones so that you don't self-sabotage because sometimes we say things but there are other reasons we don't let them let them happen and this is the second one that I want you to write down we get stuck in fear okay and I want you to jump into the chat box which means we should have everybody writing something in the chat box but I want you to let me know what does it mean to you if you get stuck in fear and this is language that we're telling ourselves along the way. What holds you back? Yeah, when you get stuck in fear, it holds you back. But what is that fear? What's that fear? Why does it hold you back? What's it mean to get stuck in fear? And then we'll have a look at what's holding you back. I get told a lot of things, especially in live conferences. And some of the things I get told, come on, let's get a few more answers happening in our chat box. Participation's really important. Now, why do you get stuck in fear? I won't do it just in case it's wrong. What would people think of me um, if it didn't work? You know, what would people think of me if I stepped out and did something that I really wanted to do that, that my heart wanted me to do? Um, because I'm scared of the unknown. So there's, that's right, what, what is the unknown? You know, how do we fear the future? We don't even know what it's going to be. Scared of failure. What if I fail? What will people say? How will I feel? What if you succeeded? Some people are fearful of success too, because what does that mean? Every time we do something, it's going to make a change. And if you're not comfortable with change, you tend to let fear keep you where you are. Now, you know, we talk a lot about comfort zones and I'm not quite sure where your comfort zone is, but um, I don't really know where my comfort zone is, to be honest, anymore. There's so many things that I've done and, you know, when you get those sort of hairs on your arms stand up and you, you, think, you think of an idea you might want to do and you become a little fearful. And, but when I get that feeling for me, it's about facing everything and rising. So... When I get that bit of a fear, I know I'm on a tipping point. There is something that I'm wanting to do, to step into. And I'm lucky because courage is one of my top values. So when I do get fearful of an idea or something I want to do, I'm going, come on, girl. You know, this is what you want to do. You know, step into that courage. 
And sometimes we do things that perhaps we shouldn't do, but I'll tell you a very quick story. Um, I was in Xi'an in China a few years back and I was speaking at a conference selling smarter in an international marketplace. And after the conference, I had a couple of delegates come up. Uh, one wanted me to go to Shanghai, someone to Beijing and someone else to Xi'an. So I was in Xiamen, if I, if I said that right at the beginning. I was speaking in Xiamen, but I always wanted to go Xi'an because I've been to Shanghai and Beijing. So I took up the client offer for Xi'an. And um, I spent two, two days with their teams. I had two days left and I wanted to go to the Terracotta Warriors. So they took me there for a day and riding around the forts. And the last day they said to me, um, you can, you can um, take a gondola to the top of the mountain if you like. There's five um, hiking mountains in, in China. And I thought, wow, that'd be amazing because you know, I'm not really fit. So jumping in a gondola and going up the top and I have a bit of fear of heights, but that sounded like something I could do. It was about a 3000 foot mountain. So I thought, wow, so I rang this company. They picked me up at 6 a.m. Uh, I always travel with a really thin backpack for, for when I'm not working. So I had that with a bottle of water and an apple um, from reception. And what else did I have? I had a bit of cash. So off I went. Um, in my shorts and I had some little sketches and um, they pulled up at the mountain. There was two other people in the car, no one was speaking English. And when I got out, I said, you know, where's the gondola? And they looked at me and said, no, no, you walk. I said, I walk. And they said, yes, yes, you climb up. We'll pick you up in eight hours, eight hours. I can remember stumbling out of the car and feeling, you know, I looked at this mountain and it was very high, <laughs> I don't like heights. And there were, some steep cliffs and I remember this water on my face I'm like oh this doesn't feel so good and then three things came to me and I was told the first point was only about an hour so I thought well maybe I'll just climb to the the first point just get there and these three things I thought of the first one was this man walked past me with all these bottles of water on his head and I thought well if he can do it I can do it and then as I was starting to climb I thought this is like business you know I started my business in the GFC and it's just taking one step at a time, isn't it? You know, and unfortunately, we keep getting hit with crises, don't we? So I just thought, just take one step at a time. Um, and this is like business. Everything I've ever done in business is once I get to this level, I buy this or this for my business. And I keep challenging myself all the way up. And then the third thought was halfway up. Um, what goes up must come down. So I thought, I'll think about that later. I'm not going to let fear hold me um, from making this, this first ledge, this first north point. So I climbed to the north point and then I, it wasn't that exciting. It was just a, lot, a little strip, I had a couple of photos, a few flags. And I looked behind me at the rest of the mountain and that was where the um, south, um, the east and the west points were. And obviously the, the gondola was up there somewhere as well. And I just remember getting out my mobile phone because no one else, no one else really was speaking um, my language on the mountain. You know, apart from body language, I was able to to um, sort of converse a little bit, and people were smiling at me and probably thinking, "Who's this crazy white woman?" And uh, it was like forty degrees. <clears throat> anyway, I got out my phone and I, I I did a little video selfie because I thought I needed my friends and family to know where I was in case something happened. Now, I'm not telling you to do stupid things, but sometimes when we do, um, I now don't have a fear of heights. So I took out my phone, I did a little video, I showed where I was going and off I went. So I climbed this mountain, it was exhilarating. It was an incredible experience. I got to the top, I sat down, I ate my apple and I bought another bottle of water before I went to go back down. And, um, you know, I was just careful going down. Now, the reason I didn't go down on the gondola because it was the other side of the mountain and the people were picking me up this side. And by the end of it, I, I was okay. I felt okay to do it. So I got back down, had some photos lying on the rocks, etc. They have a they have a photographer down the bottom when you finish, which I didn't know about. And you know, I remember them picking me up and going, oh, didn't you climb? I said, yes, I climbed. They said, oh, you look so good. Oh, and I really felt good too. I thought, I don't know how I'll be the next few days, but I wasn't too bad. And it's interesting when we, we step out and do these crazy things sometimes. So I've been speaking about fear and we do a big thing on it. I won't go into it too much today, 
But um, the interesting thing was for me, I, I speak about it and at the start of this year, so the mountain was a few years ago, I've spoken about climbing this 3000 foot mountain and I didn't know the name of it. I thought oh, I'll just take the time to, to create a slide and put in the slide for my audience on what the mountain is and this is what I discovered. And I nearly fell off the bed that I was sitting on. It says the most dangerous mountain in China. <laughs> it was the most dangerous hiking mountain in China, the deadliest hike in the world. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> now, if you told me I was going to climb, <laughs> climb that, there's no way I would have done it right. For that fear, the fear of what would happen, the fear of that failure. And I might have needed months and months to prepare for it, but I probably still wouldn't have done that. Now, I'm not saying go and do, do stupid things, but sometimes when we're faced with something and we pick up that challenge, it starts to increase that, that strength that we have inside, that belief that we can do things. So um, you don't have to do silly things um, like me, but however, it's interesting sometimes when we don't know and we just take that first step into the unknown, what can be possible? And I love that anything is possible once we start. So um, I don't know what you're feeling fearful of at the moment, but it's the start of a year and it's really time to face everything and rise. And I have a thing, a lot of my, my friends uh, are really worried about what could happen in the future, et cetera, et cetera. But if you can't do anything about it, you need to let it go. If you can do something, then take an action. But if you can't, you need to let it go. So for me, it's easy because I can just pray and let that go. You know, for other people, it depends what sort of faith or different things that you have. But I can't fear something that I can't take any action around, if that makes sense. So start to have a look at what is holding you back. Why are you fearing things? And why are we scared of what could happen? Because what if it didn't happen? The third thing we do is we procrastinate too much. Let me show you this video and then you can write in to the chat what you do when you procrastinate. So this is the different language that we are telling ourselves along the way. This morning I got up and got ready quickly because I had to get a lot of stuff done. I sat down at my desk to start getting my stuff done and I spilled my coffee so I got a sponge to clean it up and I figured I'd take an extra minute to clean the whole desk because a clean desk would help me get my stuff done. When I was finished I realized I hadn't eaten anything and I didn't want to be hungry while I got my stuff done so I went into the kitchen and I was out of cereal. When I got to the grocery store, I remembered a bunch of other crap I needed to get, and I figured I was already there, so I did my shopping for the week so I didn't have to worry about it while I got my stuff done. When I got home, I didn't feel like cereal anymore, and so I made an omelette and I did the dishes so I wouldn't have to do them after I got my stuff done, and then I went out to get some oil from the hardware store because my desk chair is kind of squeaky and I didn't want to be distracted by a squeaky chair while I got my stuff done. When I got back, it was getting kind of late, and I knew I wouldn't be able to get my stuff done today, so I started watching the Twilight Zone marathon on TV. I just have to make sure I get to bed early, because I want to be well rested tomorrow so I can get my stuff done. Hmm. <laughs> yes, right. So all of us do procrastinate at some stage. So I want you to write in, what do you do when you procrastinate? So for me, I know I generally make a cup of tea. And if I've had a really bad day around my office, there'll be about five or six cups of tea sitting around. So, you know, we, we do things to clean the house. My husband would love if I did that instead of making cups of tea. So there's all different things that we do when we procrastinate. So jump in and type in the chat, what do you do when you procrastinate? You've got one there, clean the house. Check your phone. You haven't go on social media for an hour. I know some people love Netflix. I'll just watch one and the next minute four have been watched. You know, we've all got the same amount of time as Mother Teresa, don't we? We just don't always use it good. 
All right, so there's a lot of things that we do. Come on, jump into that chat. Let me know what you do to procrastinate. And so now what I do is when I go to make that other cup of tea, I wait until I finish that task, get through it, and then my cup of tea is my reward. So if you are a little bit of a procrastinator, give yourself that challenge. Check your phone after. Let yourself do this first. All right, so I've only got a couple of there in the chat. Please pop in the chat what you do. Reminds me of a book called Eat That Frog. Yeah. And actually, I'll, I'll let you know three things that I do when I work with my salespeople. So one of the things I love to give them is a tool called Digger, Daily Income Generating Activity. So if you happen to be an entrepreneur or, you know, you're a manager, supervisor, whatever you need to do, I only get them to write down three things. So if I was in my business, what three things will bring in money to my business? It could be a follow-up that you have to do. Maybe you need to do a post. Um, whatever it is, have a look at three things. But only write three things down the night before so that when you get in that morning, they're the three things you attack. Because what happens is people love to write really big lists. Then they only choose the things they want to do, not really the things that have to be done. Okay, so see if you can give yourself that challenge digger digger can be your new friend daily income generating activity all right the fourth thing we do is we're not willing to fail so just imagine if he asked her out and she said no but what if he asked her out and she said yes see a lot of people aren't willing to fail they'll dip their toe in a little bit and then they'll jump back out and go see it didn't it didn't work on you it wouldn't work so it's another form of self-sabotage. What are you saying to yourself when you're not willing to fail? And this is another form of self-sabotage where you don't jump the whole way in. You know, I think you have to go on boots and all when you come up with an idea. And I know from my training company days, um, when we came up with a new idea, we had to commit fully to it. If we didn't, it wouldn't have worked. And so many people have so many fingers and so many pies and they can't keep up with it because they haven't committed. But once you commit, it's amazing what happens. So let me have a look in the chat. You know, what are you not willing to fail about in 2020, 2021? Well, what are you willing to fail about? What are you willing to jump in boots and all and do? I prefer that answer. What are you willing? Because really there's no losing. There's only learning. And I think every time we jump into something, we learn something more about ourselves, about the process. Sometimes we learn what doesn't work, which is just as important. You know, how many times did it take to create the light bulb? Have, look that up. It's incredible. So you've got to be willing to fail. Now, I haven't seen anything coming through in my chat there. Being a team leader, great, great. Jump in, boots and all. And, you know, knowledge is power. The more that we find out about things, the more empowered we are to be able to jump in and to be willing to, to fail. All right. Reading more business, personal development books, fantastic. Great to hear, great to hear that. All right, number five. Are you ready to write it down? We overanalyze things. We overanalyze things to the nth degree and then we don't let them go. You know, give me a reaction. Who here is an overanalyzer? I'm sure we're going to have a few of you that, <laughs> that hate to let things to let things go. Oh, I'll just hold no, I don't think it's quite right yet. Let me have a look at it. And um, yeah, absolutely. And you know, if we if we do that, if we keep telling ourselves, if we keep using that internal language that it's it's not right, then it never happens. And what the exciting news is, is there's something called continuous improvement. So what I love to do is just to let things out there and then I can continually improve them and I can contextualize them and bespoke them for my clients. So don't be afraid um, to let things go and then to have a look at you know, what you can do with it. And number six, they say women are very good at this. And apparently it's multitasking. However, everyone is multitasking in the world today. But it's interesting. Are we really multitasking? So I'm going to get you to do an activity for me. 
So please grab a piece of paper. Actually, I'm going to grab a piece of paper and show you this too. I might use my board. All right. So in a moment, we've all got a full name. So my full name is Catherine Malloy, but it, and I want you to use your full name for this activity. And I'm going to time you, so don't do anything yet until I say go, okay? Don't do anything. So what I'm gonna get you to do is to write one letter, and then I'm gonna give, get you to put that letter, give it a number underneath. Can you see that back there? Okay, so one letter, then one number. So C, one, A, two, T, three, H, four. And I'm gonna get you to do that on your paper all the way for your whole name, all right? So you've got your pens and papers. Give me a reaction if you're ready to go. Give me a thumbs up. Love to have a look to see. Yep, great, fantastic. All right, so you've got your pen and paper in, in your hand. Now wait, don't do anything. I'm going to time this. All right, so on the count of three, and then I'm gonna say go and I want you to do it then, okay? One, two, three, go. So one letter, one number. One letter, one number for your whole of your name. Then give me a thumbs up reaction when you're finished. All right, we've got one there, great. All right, so everyone, great, thank you. You can stop now. Okay, so we had to go from letter to number, from letter to number. I don't know how you felt about that, if it felt a little frustrating. I know when I was doing it, it was a bit annoying, to be honest. I'm going to get you to do it again in a moment, and I'm going to say one, two, three, go, and then I will time you. I'm writing down my time for my first one right now. But this time, you are going to write your letters all the way across the page for the whole of your name, and that's Catherine Malloy, so the whole of your name, and then you'll do the numbers underneath, okay? So I'm going to count to three again, and then when I say go, you will start. All right, let me reset this. Okay, one, two, three, go. Give me a reaction when you finish. Fantastic, all right. Okay, so the interesting thing was the first time it took 16.7 seconds. The second time it took 8.10 seconds. So this is a little bit like our life. I'll just move this out of the way. I don't know if we can really do two things at once. I guess mums can bounce a baby in a bouncer and make sandwiches at the same time or something like that. But what we generally do is we'll be in an email, then we'll be doing something on the phone, then we'll be looking up something else and we'll have another computer. And so we're going in and out of things. And this is where burnout is starting to occur because it's exhausting. And so the first time that you did it, let me know in the chat, the first time you did that, did you find that a little bit, that exercise a little bit more tiring? Going in and out to being able to go. <laughs> I love that. I forgot how to spell my name the first time. <laughs> yeah, first time we really had to use that brain as well. But, you know, this is why they're saying, you know, when you do have an activity that you dedicate some time to it before you start to go back into all those emails and everything else, you know, turn them off, finish that one thing so you can get on to the next. Let me tell you something that happened to me on Friday. Friday, I found out that I'm finishing my master's in leadership. I had a whole assessment due. Like I thought we were off for January and I'd put it into my calendar for February. Must have been wishful thinking. Anyway, I just happened to check my results from my last one and I jumped out. Now I thought oh, I'd better go back in just to have a check about, just to make sure the date and everything's right in my calendar for the next assessment. Could not believe it. It was due yesterday on the 11th. Nearly had a heart attack. So that meant that weekend that we've just had, I had to cancel. I also had two. I was speaking in, where was I speaking? I was speaking in India and I was speaking in um, Greece. 
on Saturday night, two different events I had to prepare for for Saturday night. Um, a, a full two 750 word assignments that had to be done, cited, et cetera, for this other assessment. And then I, I had been nominated for a few awards and I decided I was going to do them this time. And I'd allowed myself to be able to do them on the weekend, but everything else was there. So I applied, I ended up applying for one of the awards, had to get that done and in by yesterday. Then someone asked if I would nominate them and fill out a sheet for them for an award. So then I had to do that as well. And, um, and then of course, here I am today. So things are possible and I did get them done, but I could only focus on one at a time. If I was trying to get them all done together, um, it would have been a mess. So I just had to work my way through one and then work my way through the next thing and then the next thing. And this is how important it is. Otherwise I would have self-sabotaged. My brain would have exploded. <laughs> so it's important that we, um, you know, don't multitask. So having a look back through what we've just been through, you know, I'd like to know which one you do. And some people say, hey, Kath, you know, I, um, I, I'm an overachiever. I do all of these. But just have a look at least one thing that you know that you've discovered that you self-sabotage. Do, do you sink it into your bones? Or maybe you get stuck in fear. Maybe you spend too much time procrastinating or you're not willing to fail. Or perhaps you spend a lot of time overanalyzing and don't let go of it. Or maybe you're a multitasker. But let me have a look. I would love to see um, overthinking, great. See what you are. So jump into the chat, write that down. It's really important to identify it. And on these six lists that you've written out, circle one of these. And that way you can change your language. When you change your language, you change your life. You can change the language you're using to do these things. If I told myself, oh my God, I'm never gonna get this done. How will I do it? Um, I've got too much and tried to do everything. That would have been the end of it for me. But being able to understand and focus through one, especially through this activity, it is so much easier, wasn't it? Focusing on just the letters then just the numbers. And that's what we need to do. So fear sometimes stops us, Cameron. Yeah, absolutely. Overthinking, definitely. I could have overthought that weekend and just exploded. Um, but once we start to use the language and start to create some processes too, it can change everything. You know, how we lead ourselves is so important. So now that you've circled one of these, all you have to do is stop, you know, don't self-sabotage. Once you, once you bring it to the forefront, you can now consciously know when you're over-analyzing and say you need to let it go. Start an act, another activity and then come back to it. Don't hold yourself back. If you start to feel fear, why am I feeling fear? Maybe this is something you need to step into. And that's the exciting thing about fear, facing everything and rising. I created the Conscious Connection Framework where... Communication really begins with you and me. And our body language plays a massive part. Um, my book, The Million Dollar Handshake, was made business book of the year by Orion UK. It's been translated in uh, traditional Chinese, uh, Taiwanese, released in all the Commonwealth countries at the end of this month, apparently. It's been bought in America for the American and Canadian marketplace. So um, it's body language, mindset, behaviours, all those wonderful things. Um, and we're just going to have a quick look um, as we um, get into wrapping up today, uh, understanding that body language in a nanosecond, you can change the way you're feeling by just re-energising that body, shoulders back, head up, telling yourself you can do this. You know, being mindful of those thoughts that you're thinking and the words that you're saying. Um, I love that our, our understanding our behaviours can really make a difference to the way that we lead ourselves and lead others. I'm going to give you a very quick activity um, to have a look at maybe the way that you're likely to behave in your leadership style. You know, who are you? Now, we've got to do this quite quickly, so jump into it. There's an arrow to the right and an arrow to the left. If you're fast paced, talk loudly at times, love reaching and you love setting goals and taking action, making things happen, then I just want you to stand up and take a step to the right side. If you're a little bit more reserved when meeting people for the first time, you know, and you like to take your time to think about things and work through your tasks, then I want you to step to the left. All right. So make a choice now. Quickly move. 
I'm going to the next screen. Give me a thumbs up. Give me a reaction. Are you ready? Come on, I need to see a reaction. Great. All right, so this is for the people on the right side of the room. You can put in the chat if you're a right person. Now, there's two things that you're going to do here. If you like to focus on principles, goals, and tasks, you make those quick decisions, you love systems and processes and making lists, and you're standing on the right, I want you to take a step to the front. If you like to have fun in teams, you're loud, you've got charisma, you can be flexible, um, and if you make a list, you normally lose it, then I want you to step to the back. Okay, you've made your choices. I want you to remember this. The ones at the front on the right, you're going to be our eagles. The ones at the back, you're going to be our peacocks. So remember that because now we're going to our left side people. Okay? So if you love using facts and figures, you know, working by yourself on projects, you're firm-minded, I want you to take a step to the front. If you prefer to use those feelings to make decisions, you know, you're soft-hearted, cooperative, compassionate, um, and you'd love focusing on people. So if you love focusing on people, step to the back. If you love focusing and getting those tasks done, step to the front. All right, give me a thumbs up for those people that you're ready to move on. Great. So the people at the front on the left, you're our owls, and the people at the back, you're our doves. All right, so I want you to write in here, we've got an owl. I want you to write in, are you an owl? Are you an eagle? Are you a peacock? Are you a dove? Let's write that into so we can all see where we are. Beautiful, fantastic. And let's have a look at your leadership styles. So if you were that eagle, you'd be more directing. You'd be looking at that vision, goals. And you can come across as demanding and innovative. That would be the way that you would lead lead. Um, if you were the peacock, you're kind of like all that involving and getting all the teams to do things and let's have some fun while we're doing it. You have a bit of action, variety and equality is important. So start to think of those leaders you've worked with. Do, can you see those lead, leaders that set those goals, have that vision and demanding to get to those results? Or perhaps you've had a leader that is fun and wants different action all the way through. Or maybe you've had a supporting calm leader or maybe this is you. You're calm, you're steady, harmonious, and you know you love to think that what you're doing is important and can create that legacy as well. Or maybe you're more conscientious. Maybe you're a little bit more like our our owl. You like that you lead by structure and responsibility. You oversee things and you're quite stable. So starting to have a look at these are our different leadership styles and we go very big with this. You know, I love using the disc because it's simple and easy to remember and it works. It's in 55 different languages around the world and in nearly every country is using it. Um, it's a great model and it shows you the top says active. So our eagles and our peacocks, they're more likely to be active, breathe a little faster, walk a little faster. Our doves and our owls, they're a little bit more reserved, they breathe a little slower, and they're a little calmer. And you'll see the word people orientated on the right there. So our peacocks and our doves, they're a little bit more people orientated. So that means they'll be a little bit more in that emotional zone. Whereas our eagles and our owls are more task orientated. So it's really important that that job gets done. The eagles will tell people what needs to be done. The eyes want to relate with you. The S's will accept or not accept those situations and that work. And our owls are going to assess everything and themselves. And look, if you want to know more about this, so you can dig in and find out more about yourself and more about others, you know, please send us a message and the team will um, send you our PDF and online around it. It is also in, in the book and um, the six chapters in the book also have uh, free online content for each chapter as well. So the reason we do all this, our body language, our mindset and behaviours is to create a level playing field where we have more win-wins in our life and win-wins for other people with our communication. Because I think this is so important um, to become better communicators. You know, it is still the number one skill required on the planet. Let me show you this quick video. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks so much. Bye. Hello, oh, what's up? I, uh, I have your bonus check. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, and now, uh, 
I want you to be prepared. His uh, fate is not exactly what we discussed. Why not? Because after careful consideration, I felt that figure was not uh, appropriate. Although you may not agree, uh, you have to trust my uh, experience and trust? judgment. In, in you want me to trust you? Do me a favor, Ed. Don't use big words you don't understand. It's a complicated issue, Aaron. You know, I did a job. A lawyer. You should reward me accordingly. It's not complicated. You know what? That is the problem. All you lawyers do is complicate situations that aren't complicated. Do you know why people think all lawyers are backstabbing, blood-sucking scumbags? Because they are. And you know, I cannot believe that you were doing this to me now when I'm up to my in Kettleman plaintiffs, which, by the way, looks like it's going to be double the amount that we had in Hinkley. And you expect me to go out there, leave my kids to be looked after by strangers, knock on doors, get these people to trust you with their lives, and the whole time you're f***ing me. I want you to know something, Ed. It is not about the number. It is about the way my work is valued in this firm. It's about how, no matter what I do, you're not... As I was saying, um... Uh... I decided that uh, the figure you proposed was uh, inappropriate, so I increased it. Uh, do they teach beauty queens how to apologize? Because you suck at it. <laughs> So okay. did he set her up? Yes, he did. Because he knew her behaviour style. He knew how she'd be likely to behave. Plus, it was a movie. But it was great to see. And, you know, knowing this DISC model can really help you manage your workplace relationships better. Starting to understand who it is that you're speaking to and starting to speak to them in their language. Um, so I'd love you, you know, when you when you go away from today, you know, to dig a bit deeper into this, it makes such a difference to the language that you use. And we know when we change our language, we change our life. If you're fighting with somebody at home, start to start to be more conscious of the, the body language that you're bringing in and the words that you're saying, you know, those reactions, because we, we react in one twenty-fifth of a second before we speak. And that's why. That's why there, are, there is so much miscommunication and why husbands and wives can fight for up to two days without saying a word because they raise an eyebrow at the wrong time. But body language is a whole nother discussion one time with you. Um, so it's really important because even to have those better relationships at home, we need to use that language, the language of our leadership. You know, everyone is a customer, whether they're working for you whether they're working with you, whether there's someone purchasing. And we come up against people all the time and we think, oh, that person's so difficult. But are they difficult or are they just different? And if we understand that, we can make a difference. Good morning. Can I take your order? Can I get a tall chai? A uh, large black coffee. A what? Large black coffee. Do you mean a venti? No, I mean a large. He means a venti. Yeah, the biggest one you got. Venti is large. No, venti is 20. Danny. Yeah. Large is large. In fact, tall is large, and grande is Spanish for large. Venti's the only one that doesn't mean large. It's also the only one that's Italian. Congratulations, you're stupid in three languages. Look, venti is a large coffee. Really? Says who? Fellini? How much is that? Here's a 10. Do you uh, accept lira, or is it all you know euros? No, what? Just keep now? the change. Jesus, Dan, you know what they call the sizes here. You know what? You've been picking fights with everybody. The girl at the party. She said ASAP. Oh, ASAP. Oh, I'm sorry. Huge crime. It's like 24-7 or been there, done that. You mm. hate that too. I don't hate it enough to let it ruin my day. It's getting worse. You know, man, the sun is shining, but you have lost the ability to take any joy in life. I, I can't stand it anymore. You're just a miserable You're mean to everybody. And FYI, it's called a venti because it's 20 ounces. 20. Venti! Is that true? And that's how quickly we miscommunicate. You know, there's you, there's me, and between us, there's some barriers. Um, and it's in, the, it's in these barriers that, that the problems happen. So quickly jump into the chat, just write down what, what are some barriers that stop communication from happening, from flowing? 
So I'd love to see, jump into the chat. We're getting close to finishing. I'd love to see, yeah, our emotions, the way we're feeling on a certain day can change the way that we react and communicate. Cultural, great cultural differences. Um, our tone of voice, fantastic. That tone of voice, that pace, that pitch, um, the breathing, all these things create barriers. So jump in, write some things. What are some other barriers? And I'll share a few with you as well. Um, even our education, and as you saw there, the vocabulary that was used um, became confusing, even though they're, they're saying the same thing. You see, we see things differently, and that's what causes most of our miscommunication. And then it leads to those conversations. So very, very quickly, I just want you to type in to the chat, what do you see? What do you see first? Go. Type in what do you see? Great. Someone saw faces first. Two faces. Excellent. Did you all only see two people? Or did someone see like a candlestick or a vase? Or can you see that now? Give me a reaction if you can see it. Yeah, great. What about this one? I want to know, can you see an old lady or can you see a young lady? What do you see first? Let me know. An old lady and then the young lady. Great. Old. Awesome. Young. See, some people saw young, some people saw old. What do you see now? Let me know. What do you see first? A winking face. A fish. Right, most of you this time saw the winking face first. Some people see the fish first. We don't always see things the same way. So we need to start to language things better when we're speaking with people. What do you see now? What do you see first? An Indian, a face, an Indian, then an Eskimo, an Indian head. Some people see an Eskimo looking into a cave. Once again, we see things differently. And last but not least, what, do you, what number do you see? Great, just checking to see if you're colorblind or not. I'm just kidding. But there is dangerous misconceptions, and that is that people will always pay attention when you're speaking to them. No, they don't. And when people say they're paying attention, they really are. No, they're not. And when someone says, I know, they really do. You need to check in and we need to start to use our words to find out what it is that they know. Because I could have an idea here and think I've told you this. And even walking away from today, everyone could take something different away from what I've said. And no one's really wrong. Saying something over and over will make sure you get my message. No, it won't. So that's why it's really important to understand that we need to really check in. We need to be really conscious about the people that we're working with and speaking with. I don't have time to show you this next video. However, I do want to give you this. So take a picture of this if you like, because when you are getting ready for those difficult conversations with teams or with someone else, you know, make sure that you have got those facts. Um, you've, you've got your list, you've written things down. Don't bring that emotion into it. We must keep it. This is what's happened. And, and then ask them. You know, ask them. Understand if there's a frequency and pattern around these things and dig a, lot, dig a little bit deeper before you go in for those conversations. Because when we have them just off the top of our head, um, a lot of the times it will just get into an argument and it doesn't solve anything. So if you talk to a person in your language, it goes to the head. But when you talk to a person in their language, it goes to the heart. And that's part of emotional intelligence and understanding that there are destructive behaviours and they trigger negative emotions. And, of course, constructive behaviours trigger those positive emotions. So here's a couple of destructive and constructive behaviours. So you might have a look at things that you are doing if you're doing any of these, what are the opposite? What could you do instead of that? 
and you know more different behaviors are more likely to judge for instance a c and a s the more reserved they'll sit back more likely to judge that scenario over perhaps a, a d or an i but understanding that also means that when you're doing you go oh i can just let that go um so it's it's important that when we're explaining things or talking to people that we really focus on those conversations and not not use personal attacks. This will really help you um, having those difficult conversations. And even we have difficult conversations with ourselves. And sometimes we tell ourselves that we can't do things. And uh, there's one here, Cameron says, people can assume you're not being open and honest and transparent when you are being open and honest and as, and as transparent as you can be. So what's important is to check in with them, but not, not assume that they're thinking that you're not being open and honest. So once again, then we would be judging them thinking that. Um, so it's, it's very tricky, but it's something that just needs to get practiced. And the more that we uh, notice it and the more that we notice the words that we're saying around it, we can start to then make a difference. You know, oh, I'm going to have to do this. Don't you hate when you have to do something? No one's going to do it. But, you know, I'm... I'm I'll be glad to do this. Or perhaps, you know, it's a challenging opportunity for me so that I can start to, you know, I wasn't good at that, but I'm really improving. We need to change our language and it can change the way that we feel. It can give us more energy as well. So negative thoughts are going to come and that's okay. We can let them go as well. But what I love doing is turning that negative into a positive. You know what? I don't want to get up this morning and exercise. Okay. I'm just going to exercise for 15 minutes this morning because I know it'll give me some energy. Whereas on those days when you're tired, if I go and exercise for a whole hour, I'm going to be later on, I generally find that I peak and then I drop. So it's really important to, instead of just too tired, hey, I can do 15 minutes today. You know, start to give yourself that positive reinforcement. And I was doing laps in the pool after riding the horses in the morning. And um, my daughter said, add on two laps every day. I started to do that, but then I didn't want to swim anymore because it was getting so hard. So that's when I allowed myself to go, okay, today I'm doing this many. Um, and I don't have to do that all the time. So, you know, keep that positivity going in what you do. Don't make things so hard and so uncomfortable that you just give up. It's these small tweaks that we make in our language that can make big differences. And of course, don't forget, um, we do have to deal with stress, having those deep breathing, visualize those outcomes you love. Music and laughter, guys, is the best thing. I've been married for 30 years and you need music and laughter in your life, definitely. Daddy's going to play them. A I love this little video where, where the dad sleeps. starts to play. And so um, I hope after after today you can put on a, on a favorite song and have a little bit of a, a bit of a dance in your seat. <laughs> Get that energy going. It's so cute. Um, Daddy's going to play but, them. If you know everything we've spoken about today, but you don't do it on that regular basis, then you don't really know it. It really is about revolutionising the way that you connect and communicate. Understanding our areas of nonverbal intelligence. You know, our bodies change our minds. We can change our body in a nanosecond, which can bring that energy in. And when we change our mind, we can change our behaviour. So if our behaviour has been negative, we can start to change that. When we change our behavior, we actually change our outcomes. And this is what I love. Going into wrap up, I just want to say all of you have phones, all of you have email, all of you have laptops. If I said to you, I'm going to send you a virus right now to all your phones and computers, would you open it? No. Yet the most important computer on the planet today, yes, our brain, we are happy to download crap into it all the time. Start to think about what are you watching? You know, what are you hearing? What are you saying? What are you thinking? So we can make a difference because there really is a reason why conscious leadership is said to be the most important and crucial aspect in business and the entrepreneurial world today. And what I'm doing is creating in life more seals, conscious of contact, conscious of others and conscious of self. Today, we're creating seals. Each one of you, I hope, will walk away um, more conscious and emotionally intelligent leaders because what we walk past, we really do accept in life. And I think it's time to draw a line. 
Look at those things that we see, those words that are being said, actions that we're taking, or perhaps actions we're not taking. What we walk past, we really do, we really do accept. And is it acceptable? You know, I like this little quote, if you, if you see someone falling behind, walk beside them. If you see them being ignored, find a way to include them. Always remind people of their worth because your worth can't be taken away. And consciously start to lead through crisis and beyond. Bring that consciousness to that body, to that mindset and to our behaviours. 500 years ago, only kings and queens could impact a million or oh, a billion people. 500 years ago, incredible. 100 years ago, it was the industrialists. But today, it's you and me. And what if the future of the world was a reflection of you? Well, I believe the future is you. It's each and every one of us. And leadership is not a position. It is a conscious decision. So I really want to thank you for spending time with me today. I hope that we have given you some tools to start to think about how not to self-sabotage through our body language, through our mindset, how to start having a bit of a look at those behaviours and starting to understand people more to create better win-win situations. And I really look forward to um, hearing from you or contact me via email if you would like our free behaviours uh, PDF. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kath. What a great way to, to begin for 2021. Um, if you're able to turn off that sound, then it won't reverberate my voice. Thank you so much. Um, so if you guys have any questions, if you want to pop them in the chat box right now, that would be great. We've got a couple of more to answer any questions. Uh, while you're doing that, I just thought I would share, uh, in terms of the disc, my previous job, I had a team of seven uh, that I looked after, and I was having a bit of trouble managing them, and I couldn't put it down to why, um, and I have had a team for a few years, so I wasn't, you know, new to it, and we ended up getting someone to come in and do disc with us. Uh, and what we discovered is that my style was a split between D and C. And I had seven team members who were all high eyes. So in terms of communication, they would come into a meeting and they would throw a thousand ideas at me, super excited, a lot of energy with no kind of game plan or anything to back that up. They just wanted to tell me their ideas and then me being into the detail would be so frustrated and shut down all their ideas because I wanted to know how they were actually going to do it. So it was super eye-opening. Uh, and in future, when I was hiring, I was really looking at DISC to balance the team out. So I think it's something that is really amazing for teams. Um, and I would definitely recommend you get in touch with Kath if you want to know more information about that. Um, when you were talking about the different styles, we had Eagle and Owl and a few others. Um, Kath, I wondered, is it best to be across all of them? Or am I okay being a leader just on my one Owl, if that makes sense? Like, what, what's the balance yeah. that you Okay, so there's no right and there's no wrong, but there is an understanding. So you know, some people are across all of them, but it doesn't mean that they bring out the right one at the right time, if that makes sense. Yeah. So once we're more conscious, so for instance, if I was a high C and I learned more about me, it means that when I'm speaking to my eye, that, you know, people, you hear people, I'll meet them halfway where the hell is halfway how does that person even know you're meeting them halfway and if they don't understand the disc how, how would they know what their halfway is so what's really important is we go the whole way so if I'm speaking to an I what language do I need to use to connect with that person better because it's usually the ones that are opposite like I and C is so opposite the C really wants to know the facts the figures here's the dot points and the eyes want to just talk about the whole thing so um, it's important to understand that. So then it means if I was moving into, as a C, moving into an I person, I'd let them get out all those ideas, write that all down, and then keep questioning them because they want to talk, they want to tell you. And then I would be able to start to create my how-to from there. 
Yeah, it's so good because once I realized that they were all high eyes, all they wanted was for me to hear their ideas. And then I would sit on it for a day or so. And even though I always knew I was going to say no, I would wait. And then the next day I would say, now I've thought about your idea, et cetera, et cetera. And look, we're not going to be able to because of X, Y, Z. And they would be like, okay, that's great. I've already moved on to something else anyway. Because that was their personality. Whereas I was sitting in the meeting saying, no, no, no. And I was just frustrating them and I was shutting them down. So it was massively eye-opening for me, for sure. Well, with a lot of the I people in the office, the best thing is to use the six hats method where everyone wears the green hat at the one time and gets all the ideas out or the yellow hat. And now we have the black hat. We're, we're going to black hat these ideas, like write them all down. And then they'll come up with their own risks on each one. And then they'll come up with their own positivity on these each one. And then everyone's doing it at the same time because otherwise it, it's it's just a jumble. And when people keep coming up with ideas and they keep getting knocked on the head, eventually they won't come up with ideas. And if nothing changes, nothing changes. So we don't get any continual improvement anywhere. So it is really important to to you know bring in trainers that that do know what they're doing in their areas of communication to make that difference for sure. Yeah, we had a trainer that when they came in and explained it, my team even understood me better. Like it works both ways. It wasn't just me understanding them. They understood why I always asked them for the detail, why I always wanted to know the facts and the figures behind their big grand idea. Um, and I have to say it even works in your personal life because right. my husband, I worked with him at the time and he is also a high eye. And I think it gave us in our relationship even more understanding of who we are as people. So I just think it's such an important tool and I'm so glad that you spoke about it today. Thank you. And it's been wonderful being with all of you um, today. I hope you have a wonderful 2021. We've had a very tough 2020 and we've learned a lot of lessons. So hopefully we can bring those into 2021 and just make it a bit of a smoother year. I totally agree. And um, I will wrap up now, but thank you everybody for joining us. We do have a, another webinar next week. If you want to register for that, you would have been sent an email, but today's um, webinar will be recorded and we will send it out to you. So I would encourage you to re-watch that or share it with your team. If you have any questions, of course, always reach out to the Future of Leadership team. We are here for you this year. We're really excited to be working with you. Uh, but until then, I will speak to you next week. Uh, but stay safe and be kind to those around you. Thanks so much again, Kath. Thank you, everybody. Speak soon.